Now I'm under his control And I'm happy in my soul Just to know, Just to know that his grace reaches me Now I'm under his control And I'm happy in my soul Just to know, Just to know That his grace reaches me take this opportunity to welcome all of you today and to say thank you on behalf of Joanne and all of her family for your presence here. It goes without saying, especially as you watch the video of Tom's life, all the pictures that you just watched summarize and capture Tom Wood, full of life, always smiling and I'll tell you this his heart was just as big as that smile and I know that you know that and so today as we gather here all we really do is put the exclamation point on a great life that Tom lived Tom would want us to celebrate and honor his life but more than that, he would want all the glory to go to his Father in heaven. And that's the life that he lived. And today, I know I speak on behalf of all of those that will come to this platform to say some words. We are all honored to be able to speak and share a few words about our friend, Tom Wood. And so if you have your program in front of you, I want to... Uh, go ahead and introduce to you all the ones that will be uh, taking part in our service today. In just a moment, three friends of Tom's from childhood that were very close. In fact, Tom thought that these three ladies sang like angels. And I heard them about an hour ago in here, and I'm telling you right now, they are angels. And you will see that in just a moment. And so Beth Perry and Anel Galt and Cheryl Hedlund will be so I'm singing, Be Still My Soul. Well, we're going to have some congregational singing today, um, led by Mark and Diana Welch and Lindsay McCarter and myself. And we'll be singing the new song. Uh, Coach Stallings will come in just a moment and give some remarks. And a personal friend of uh, Tom and his family, Dr. Don Crockett, will come and share uh, some memories with us. And then we'll have another congregational hymn, uh, None of Self and All of Thee. And then we'll have some family remembrances by uh, Gina and Stacy, uh, some sister-in-laws, and they'll be sharing some insights from their family uh, with us. And then we'll be singing together It Is Well With My Soul, and then I'll, I'll share some words, and then we'll sing together The Greatest Commands. You'll find that on page 448 in your song books. And then one of our shepherds here at Lamar Avenue, Richard Peace, a very close personal friend of Tom's, and they taught life group together. Uh, Richard will uh, speak and share some words uh, from their friendship as well. And then throughout the service, we are going to hear uh, Tom himself uh, read some scripture to us and pray uh, from some excerpts from some of his uh, Bible class lessons that he uh, delivered here uh, at our church. I want to read these words from Joanne and her family. She says, I write these words with an overflowing, grateful heart to say thank you to our beautiful church family, to our dear friends, to our sweet, loving, giving family, and to our precious life group. She said, you've truly sustained us with love, encouragement, and food, and have been praying without ceasing for the healing of this beautiful, wonderful spiritual giant. God brought him into my life, and he has healed and changed me forever. I love him with all my heart. Our Heavenly Father has answered our prayers, and she says, my darling is healed. I thank you and love you all dearly. 
And so today we come together to celebrate and to remember and to give God all the glory for Tom Wood. Tom was born on August the 12th, 1950 in Big Spring, Texas, the only child of Buell and Dina Wood. He passed from this life and received his ultimate healing on Tuesday, November the 26th, as he was taken to be with his Lord uh, while he was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, seeking medical treatment for his cancer. Tom was a graduate of Big Spring Schools, and then he had a full scholarship to the University of Texas, where he majored in engineering. In 2006, he retired from a district manager position uh, from UPS. The most important thing in Tom's life were his faith, his family, his involvement with his beloved Lamar Avenue Church family, and above all, God's Word. Found in the front of Tom's Bible were handwritten words, and here's what they said. What I think about God is the most important thing about me. One thing I knew about Tom, if Tom wrote something in the front of his Bible, it was special to him. And I'll share some other things that he had written in his Bible later, but I love that sentence. What I think about God is the most important thing about me. And so faithful and true, he could always give account of his love for Christ and the church. And Tom did that every time that he had opportunity. He was preceded in death by his parents and his father-in-law, Chester Jackson, who loved, who loved him like a son. On June the 6th, 1998, Tom married the former Joanne Jackson and Heath, and they began a new chapter of their life together. And Joanne, I want you to know, on behalf of all the ones here, you were a rock to him. You were his giant. And just seeing the two of you together was just beautiful. And to see you walk with him and take care of him the last nine months the way you have, wow. What a beautiful testimony. What a wonderful example that you have set for everybody. And we love you. Survivors today include his wife, Joanne, six children, Matt Wood and Sam and Eric Wood, Shane Prestridge and wife, Gina, Amy Owens and husband, Doug, and Ty Prestridge and his wife, Stacy, six grandchildren whom he loved with all his heart and had so much fun with. And so today to Katie and Chloe and Langdon and Lexi and Ridge and Reed, I know there's a void in y'all's heart. But the time that you had to spend with your papa was something really special. He's also survived by his mother-in-law, Marilyn Jackson, and three siblings, Janine Jackson, Kathy McNutt, and husband Aubrey and Scott Jackson and wife Suzanne, numerous nieces, nephews, and a host of friends. Among the greatest, his two cats, Kitty, and Bevo, I know Bevo, I had to do that. And a man's best friend, his dog Jack. And if you knew Jack, you know right now Jack is lost as he can be. Just running all over that house trying to find Tom. And they were inseparable. And it was so fun to watch them. About nine months ago, when Tom received the diagnosis, after the doctors left the room, he looked at Joanne, and he said these words. He said, don't worry. Jesus will heal me either way. And if you ever received updates from Tom on the blog, you know that he would give the update about his condition and how things were going with him. And he would always sign off. And under his name, he would put Philippians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. And he didn't type those verses out because he wanted you 
to look it up for yourself in your Bible and read it. Tom was a big believer in that. Look it up and read it. And so as we begin our service today, I want you to hear these words that Tom encouraged us with from the Apostle Paul from Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. As we enter into this time of celebration, as Tom loved to do, he believed that every service should begin with prayer and end with prayer. And so today I want to open us up in prayer, and later in the service, Tom himself will lead us in our closing prayer. So let's pray as we begin. Father God, we thank you so much for being with us today. Father, we thank you for being with us throughout our life. And Father, today as we gather in this place, we do so knowing that our brother Tom is in a much better place than we are. And all we can do from our perspective right now, we can only imagine what he sees, what he's thinking, and what he's experiencing. And I pray that all of us, because of the life that Tom lived and the example and his testimony and his witness, I pray that all of us will live our life in preparation for eternity as well. We thank you for that, Father. Father, I thank you for his sweet family. And I pray that you, being the God of all comfort, will hold them in the palm of your hands and may they feel your presence, not just today, but every day of life from here forward. Father, thank you for walking with us and guiding us through the valley of the shadow of death. And I pray that as we sing songs today and as we share words and memories about Tom, we pray that all the glory can go to you. We ask you, Father, that you bless our time together, and it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. of grief or pain, leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, the Thy heavenly friend 
welcome while he dwelt below. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on when we shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow forgot, love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears or past all safe and blessed we shall meet at last To hear the song of praise we pour to sing below, and though it takes the parting of the waves, yet I must outward go. I hope to hear throughout a number days the song of They sing and have a new song of Moses and the Lamb. I want to hear, oh, to hear the angels singing, singing to bid me welcome me to mansions bright and fair. fair. A precious life from that I may own and where I want to hear that mighty chorus sweetly sing. I want to hear that mighty chorus sweetly sing. I want to hear that mighty chorus sweetly sing to hear it. was born, yet he who walked the Galilean coast sometimes was sad forlorn. He left the earth to send the Holy Ghost to guide us till that morn. They sing in them a new song of Moses and the Lamb. I want to hear, oh, to hear the angels singing, singing to bid me welcome, welcome me. to mansions bright and fair. I want to hear. Oh, to Oh, to see, oh, to see the master.
master bring. See the master bring a precious crown of life to me. That I may own and wear. I want to hear that mighty chorus sweetly sing. I want to hear that mighty chorus sweetly sing. I want to hear that mighty chorus sweetly sing. To hear it swell and ring. Joanne. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to say a few words about my friend, Tom Wood. When we think about friend, I love the poem about friendship. When things don't come out right, he turns right in. When none of your dreams come true, he is. He never insists on seeing you, except when nobody else wants to. When you get turned down, he turns up. He never looks for your money, except when you've lost it. Nothing is more important to him than making you look important. And the poem goes on and it's talking about friendship. Tom was our friend. I would say that if we'd look in the dictionary under good man, there ought to be a picture of Tom Wood. He was a good man. He was a Bible scholar, friend to lots of people, loved his family, loved his animals. I hate to say this, but he loved the University of Texas. <laughs> I'd sit on that little silly couch of his and I'd say, Tom, don't you think we need to change this a little bit and get some little aggie colors in here? And he said, no, I think I'll stick with my orange. What a good man he was. We all said this from time to time to Tom. Tom, how do you feel? If I've said that one time, I've said it 50 times. Tom, how do you feel? You know what he told me one time? He said, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to win either way. He said, you can quit worrying about me. I'm going to win either way. He said, if I'm cured and get to live a little longer, what a joy it'll be to be with my family a little bit longer and love my children and the church. And he said, and if I die, I'm going to go to heaven. He said, so you can quit worrying about me. Because whatever way it's going to be, I'm going to win. Tom was not a complainer. A lot of us like to complain from time to time. I never heard him say anything other than I'm fine. Little Johnny was the same way. I've told this a lot of times. Johnny was, he was extremely sick. His oxygen saturation was down to nothing. I looked over at him and I said, Johnny, how do you feel? He said, I fine. I fine. Passed away the next morning. Tom was the same way. You know, he's taught our small group on a Sunday, the following Monday, he goes to Oklahoma, never to return. Yet he wanted to teach that class. And what a great job he did. This is how Tom lived. What does the Lord require of you? I wonder what the Lord requires of you. Micah 6 and 8, it says, Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. That's Tom Wood. In Hebrews 13 and 5, it says, Be content. Be content with whatever you have. That was Tom Wood. Proper respect. You know, some of us have a tendency to respect some people a little bit more than we do others. 
1 Peter 2 and 17, it says, show proper respect to everyone. Just show proper respect. Have you ever seen Tom Woods when he didn't show proper respect to everyone? The greatest commandment, Matthew 22, 17. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. I don't know of anybody that loved him more so than Tom would. Tom was a kind man. In Proverbs 19, 17, it says, He who is kind to the poor lends to God. Now you'd think God had everything. But it says that he who is kind to the poor lends to God. Tom was kind to the poor. Proverbs 22 and 1, it talks about a good name. A good name is more desirable than great riches. Just a good name. Never heard anybody say anything bad about Tom Wood. He had a good name. 2 Thessalonians talks about doing good. Never tire of doing good. Just don't get tired of doing good. Tom never tired of doing good, whether it was here or wherever it was. Be patient. 2 Thessalonians it talks about encourage the timid, help the weak. Be patient with everyone. A lot of us are just not patient with everybody. Tom Wood was patient. Hebrews 12 and 14 talks about holiness. Be holy. Without holiness, you will not see God. Just as simple as that. Talks about holiness. Tom Wood was a holy man. He loved the Bible. He knew the players. A lot of times we go to a game, we've got to get a program because we don't know the players. I can sort of see Tom right now. I can see him going up and uh, maybe talking to Paul. I bet he asked him, what's that thorn in his face? All I've read about you all in my life. See him talking to Abraham. Just tell me, what, what did you really think when you had that knife? Tell me about it. I can see him talking to David. Were you just a little bit scared when you were going down to fight Goliath? Were you just a little bit scared? Can't you see him talking to Peter? Peter, what really was going through your mind when you heard that cock crow the third time? We've discussed it from time to time. Can't you see him talking to Esther? Where did you get that courage? Do you know that you say the entire Jewish religion, family, people? Where did you get that courage, Esther? Let's just sit down and visit. I can see him talking to Noah. All those people laughing at you, you just kept on building that boat. That's what made you keep on building that boat? Let's sit down and talk about it. And Moses, Moses, did you ever get discouraged? You know, trying to lead those people around, they just fussing all the time. And just how did it feel when you saw that sea part? And Tom would just go, from, you know why? Because he knew the players. He could visit with them and talk to them because he knew the players. He would talk to Daniel and talk to Job. What a joy he must be feeling right now. He kept the faith. He finished the course. How many of us can really say that, that we've kept the faith, we've finished the course? 
He'll be in God's presence forever. And I can't help but just envy him just a little bit. We all think we might be there, but you know what? No question. Tom's there. Ruth Ann and I got a letter, Christmas letter. You know, you can send letters out during the Christmas vacation talking about the children, and you receive those letters and so forth. And we got a letter from this lady that had a severely handicapped child, both physically and mentally. She wrote the letter talking about the joys of raising that child. But then she talked about the struggles. This is the way she ended her letter. Life is not about waiting until the storm passes by, but it's learning how to dance in the rain. It's learning how to dance in the rain. Just do the best we can with what we've got. And in closing, I love the poem of the dash. I read where a man stood to speak at the funeral of a friend made mention of the tombstone, the dates from the beginning to the end. At first he mentioned the date of the birth, the latter he mentioned with tears. He said what matters most of all is that dash between the years because it represents all the time that he was alive upon this earth and only those who knew him best knew what that dash was worth. Matters not how much you own, your house, your cars, your cash. What matters most of all is the way you live that dash. If you could just slow down a bit and see what's true and real, try to understand how the other fellow feels. And more often wear a smile because a little dash may only last a while. And as your eulogy is being read and your life is being rehashed, are you going to be proud to hear the people say the way you lived your dash? See, Tom Wood lived his dash. He taught a lot of us how to dance in the rain. Joanne, we love you very much and all of your family, church family and the friends, and what a joy it was to be associated with Tom, the little time that I was. First, I'd like to thank Joanne for the honor of uh, choosing me to deliver some words in this memorial for Tom. And I'd like to say to her uh, and her family and to the gang members that are present that this is an honor and a humbling experience to be able to do this, but I'm very glad and happy to do it. Most people in this audience were not aware that Tom was a gang member. <laughs> and I mean that in the best possible way. Because he was a member of our gang. And our gang is represented today. There were seven of us. Tom, myself, Dean, Steve, the three girls that you heard sing before, Beth, Anel, Cheryl, and their spouses. I don't want to forget the spouses. My mom told me before I, that I, I came up here today that uh, she always felt that the best people in our family were the ones that married into it. And so I think that can probably say that about our gang too. Uh, we all met uh, a few years ago, probably about half a century ago. Uh, we met in elementary school in a little West Texas town about 350 miles away from here. Uh, we were friends in elementary school, uh, in junior high, high school, and beyond. And during the time of uh, jobs and raising families, uh, uh, we sort of lost track of Tom. Uh, most of us managed to keep in touch with each other on a regular basis, but with Tom, we just really lost contact. Uh, we had reports of him living in Albuquerque and El Paso, and um, occasionally some of the gang members would, would spot him or uh, talk with him, but we didn't have a whole lot of 
contact, unfortunately. So about 10 years ago, at one of the meetings that we periodically have, somebody said, I think we all said, that we need to find Tom. And we talked about it. And so when we finished that meeting, Dean goes home and gets on the internet and does an internet search for Tom E. Wood and then proceeds to call every Tommy Wood that came up and leave messages, <laughs> completely unsure of whether he, which Tom Wood was going to answer. And sure enough, after a week or so, Tom did call, and he was back with us at the gang. Now, as members of the gang, we like to talk about this a lot. It's, it's really hard to explain why we've stayed so close as elementary school friends for half a century. Some of it, I'm sure, is because of shared experiences, uh, because of common origins in a little West Texas town. But I think it's basically because we like each other, uh, we respect each other, and actually more than anything, it's because we love each other. So out of all this love and common, experience, common experiences, there come stories. And we get together every year or so, and we repeat a lot of these stories over and over again. And that's when our spouses roll their eyes and make faces, and I'm sure they think that we're crazy for telling these stories over and over again, but it's part of us, and it's part of who we are. And just like your family gets together and tells stories, the same ones over and over again on the holidays, it serves a purpose, and it serves a purpose to keep us all close. In many of these stories, Tom usually manages to be at the center. For instance, Cheryl told me that Tom always had a cool car. Those of us way back then always remember his yellow Chevrolet. But I happen to remember the big black Ford with the red interior that he got when he was about 16. He loved that car. He polished it. He kept it running. Tom was always tinkering with, with his car. Um, uh, but more than anything, he wanted to look cool in that car. So Steve pointed out that... Um, he was obsessed with looking uh, uh, cool in the car and that if you happened to be riding with him, you had to roll all the windows down so that the car looked perfectly cool. It made no difference if it was 90 degrees or if it was 20 degrees, uh, it, the windows had to be down. It did have a heater, but it didn't work very well. But if you were riding with Tom in his car, you had to look cool and you had to roll the windows down. So his knowledge in his, uh, about cars and so forth leads me to probably one of the most infamous stories about the gang uh, that happened after our senior year. Uh, and Nell's parents had moved to La Mesa, a town about 30 or 40 miles away from Big Spring. And for some reason, Nell was visiting and we were taking her back to La Mesa uh, where her family had moved. And all seven of us were in one car, which sounds odd, and especially to the younger people here, but the cars were really big back then in the 60s. So all seven of us fit in the car, uh, and actually quite comfortably. I think it was Beth's dad's car, and I can't remember who was driving. Um, it was nighttime, and somehow we managed to get stuck in the sand near Patricia, Texas, which is north of Big Spring, about 20 or 30 miles, out in a cotton field. So we were stuck in the sand, and all of our efforts to get unstuck were completely in vain. So, Tom, being the automotive expert, had the bright idea to let the air out of the tires so we could get better traction, which we did. And then we hit the gas only to sink deeper and deeper. <laughs> Finally, Steve and Dean had to uh, go to a nearby farmhouse. There weren't any cell phones in that time and call Nell's dad who cheerfully came out to our rescue. All of us agree that Tom uh, was one of the smartest people we have ever known. He must have been because he tutored Cheryl so that she got through trigonometry in high school. He was a straight A student in everything, but it wasn't just his native intelligence because Tom studied hard uh, and his father pushed him hard, sometimes very hard, sometimes harder than we wanted him to. Uh, but whatever difficulties Tom might have had with his dad were certainly tempered by his sweet and cheerful mother. Tom had a great relationship with his mother, and all of us guys remember how welcoming she was when we came over to visit Tom, and she was truly a wonderful mother to Tom. Cheryl mentioned that Tom was kind and friendly to everyone. 
He was quiet, respectful, and she said she never knew or heard of anyone who didn't like him. He was dependable, he was reliable, and he was humble. Anel pointed out that he was totally and sincerely surprised when in the senior year he was elected president of the National Honor Society, but it didn't surprise us at all. To illustrate his dependable personality, I have to share this little story that Dean and Steve told not too long ago of trying to find some work uh, after they graduated from high school in that summer between high school and college. And they managed to find just an absolutely terrible job outside in the West Texas heat, tying steel on, a, on highway overpasses in the mud, 100 degree plus heat, for hours and hours each day. And so after working for a couple of weeks, they decided they need to get Tom in on this too. So they went over and convinced Tom to come apply for the job, which he did, and so there they were for a while, all three of them doing tie and steel in the middle of the West Texas heat. But shortly after that, Stephen Dean quit and left Tom with that terrible job, and Tom finished the whole summer working at that terrible job as dependable and reliable as he was. But even despite all that in high school, in those days, Tom managed to have a good time. I was reminded that Tom and Anel actually went to the senior prom together, which is uh, amusing because Tom's six plus feet tall and Cheryl is, I mean, Anel is maybe five foot. They stayed out all night together, playing in the park on the playground, uh, playground equipment. Everyone loved his sense of humor and his company. We all had lunch together during our senior year in high school because the campus was closed and everyone always looked forward to those lunches because Tom always made us laugh and at times, he, as you know, he could be truly hilarious. Best comment was one that we all related to. After school, we all sort of went our separate ways to school and job and families and somewhere along the way, as I pointed out, we lost Tom. But we would have reports and no real contact, but when he finally got Tom back in the gang physically, he was the same old Tom, but he had gray hair. We were all impressed with Tom's faith in God and his love for the church. I personally was envious of his ability to express that love and faith when he led the devotional for us during our reunion weekends. And I'll always remember the last devotional that he gave for us just a few weeks ago at Cheryl's house in Lubbock. It was from one of Paul's sermons. And after hearing of Tom's final illness, it prompted me to seek comfort in one of my favorite verses from Corinthians 15, where Paul says, but let me reveal to you a secret. We will not all die. But we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment. Those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed. For as dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die, our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Now, the apostles lived with Christ for years and certainly viewed him as their savior, but they also must have felt a tremendous loss when he died because he was their friend. And in Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter, I think at least in part, was trying to console and comfort his fellow apostles about their friend Jesus when he said, But God released him from the horrors of death and, and raised him back to life, for death cannot keep him in his grip. And then he quoted King David. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to corrupt in the grave. You have shown me the way of life, and you will fill me with joy of your presence. And so, my friends, I choose to be happy and joyous today. I was chosen to stand up in front of you and add it all up, to distill Tom's life into an essence that we can take with us whenever we leave here, and of course that's impossible to do. But let me just say this. He was a smart man, a really smart man. He loved cool cars. 
He was funny, loving, dependable, and humble. He loved his wife, and he loved his family openly and proudly. He loved his God and his church deeply and fiercely. And he was my friend. If you would, turn in your songbooks, number 695. Sing along, none of self and all of these, 695. The first words I have to share today are from Janine Jackson. She is uh, Tom and Joanne's sister and our Nene. She's written, Our little sister had been single for 12 years. She had been very picky, and so had her family. The Jackson family gatherings are a true trial by fire. Then Joanne brings Tom Wood to a Sunday lunch, about 40 of us. Tom is a tall, handsome, well-spoken, silver-haired gentleman. They look like a match, but that is not enough. We watch how he interacts with Joanne, our daddy and mama, Joanne's kids, 
He is looking good to us, but we don't want to interfere too much. After a time, at one of the family gatherings, I say quietly to Joanne, you know, it's good with us if you keep Tom. He's a good one. A few months later, I am saying to her, not to be pushy, but if you and Tom just happen to want to get married, we sure would be happy to throw you a fun wedding. Then we just sat back and tried to stay out of their business. Well, mostly. I will never forget the night she called shortly before midnight one weekend and said, Tom proposed. I made her repeat it, and then we started jumping up and down and squealing on our respective phones like teenagers. Then I heard the date, six weeks away, and I had not told anyone yet about buying and remodeling a house. So Tom and Joanne never saw their wedding venue till the day of the wedding. But it didn't matter, they only saw each other. The bride came down the stairs looking like she had just found her dream to a groom that knew he had found his dream too. And I will never forget the look on my daddy's face as he led Joanne to Tom. It said, my little girl's heart is at home and it is safe. Daddy loved Tom deeply and saw Tom live his promise. Our family got three handsome new boys, Matt, Sam, and Eric. And they got sisters and brothers and cousins and aunts and uncles galore and more noise and hugs than they knew existed. What all the kids in the family got was unconditional, strong, fair, and wise love from this new bond. Tom and Joanne were the best team I have ever seen at putting God at the center to heal and love each other and to heal and love their children. Their love story wrought miracles in raising a family and reaching out to others and showing us all how letting God be the center of it all makes for a real life no matter what has come before. I have heard it mentioned that Tom was a spiritual giant, and truly he was, always studying, always thinking, always speaking with a gentle voice and love, and always trusting in his God. Ironically, our last two conversations may have been the ones he meant to leave with me for my own life. One was in a lesson he did at the parish church. He said, the law of Christ is the law of liberty, it is the law of love and voluntary, unsparing sacrifice for the good of man to the glory of God. This kept speaking to me, so I called him later to write it down just as he said it. I carry it in my Bible. The other was in a conversation as the siblings and mama gathered for lunch a few weeks ago. We lingered for hours in a conversation of faith and reaching for more God. We asked deep questions. I was speaking of how God handled situations and peoples of the Old Testament and how strict it was. I was sitting by Tom and he never skipped a beat and said, with that gentle, non-judgmental voice and kind smile, but he was always just. I have thought of that every day since, how Tom believed that God is just with every part of him. He had peace from the beginning that whatever the outcome, he would have complete healing. The rest of us just have to find our peace in knowing Tom's peace, perfect healing, and blessed reward. I am missing my brother that would send me old lady Maxine birthday cards and tease me about being older because I was older by a whole seven months. I miss the tall brother that had to change my light bulbs every time he was there because I couldn't reach. I miss how he had to bend way over to hug me because he towered over me. I miss how his words were always something you didn't miss hearing, his mischievous smile, his wisdom, his fairness, his brains and ability to parse his way through to practical solutions. I miss his sense of humor and his hair and his calming presence and his example in all things. What lives still is the great love story of Tom and Joanne Wood and how they use that love to build something that lasts by letting God be the source of that love. That is how hearts are healed and children are loved and God is glorified. Theirs is a love that loved Tom all the way home to God. Theirs is a story to give us all hope of what God can do and how he prepares two people for each other and uses their love for good. Much good is yet to come. Thank you God for Tom and his forever place in our family and for his eternal place with you. Tom, you are so loved.
as the newest member of the Wood family, I had the blessing of knowing Tom Wood for three wonderful years. And Tom filled those years with wisdom, love, and a lot of laughter. My husband Shane, one of Tom's boys, is a man of few words, but a man with a very big heart. His love for Tom was deep, meaningful, and he asked me to read this letter on behalf of him and our family. From Shane, my only wish for my mother was to find true and complete happiness, and she found that with Tom. He made her truly happy, he knew how to make her smile, and they were a team. Tom was a giving, unselfish man, never hesitated to help you out, let you use anything he had. His stuff was your stuff, whatever you needed. Tom helped us build our home a couple of years ago, and I would always cringe when I saw him pulling up to the construction site, because it never failed. Mr. UPS Safety Man would pull up right when Ty and I were on a 12-foot ladder in the bucket of a tractor dangling over the side of the house. Tom never said a word. He just stood there, shook his head, and said, I'm sure glad your mom's not here to see this. Tom was such a wise man. He always made educated decisions. But when Mr. Big City Dallas City Slicker told me he was going to buy some cows, I thought to myself, I sure hope he knows what he's doing. But Tom had done his homework and bought an amazing herd of cows. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he always did. Tom took such great care and pride in that herd of cows. Tom was my rock, someone I could always look to for spiritual guidance. Tom loved me even in my darkest days. No matter what was happening in my life, he never judged me. He just loved me. The most important thing in Tom's life was his deep love for God. He knew him on such a deep and personal level. Tom's life and example makes me want to be a better husband, a better father, and most of all, a better man. I want to follow in his footsteps so that one day I can see him again and tell him thank you for all you did for me and my family. From precious little Chloe. My papa was a role model. He was my papa and I was his CLP, childlike princess. We had a special handshake. Papa taught me about God, Jesus, and he always took me to church. I will always remember how much he loved me, and I will always love him. From Lexi. I was not able to know Tom as long as most of the family, but the time spent with him was very special to me. Tom was the most godly, loving, caring person that anyone could ever meet. He welcomed me to the family with open arms and treated me like I had been there for years. Tom and I shared something special right off the start. We had the same birthday. But I told him we were long lost twins and too bad for him because I got all the looks. <laughs> My favorite memory with Tom is when we played Scrabble and it just killed him because I finally beat him with the word hazy. It, he just got so mad but ever since then he would always greet me with, hey hazy. Tom may be gone but he will never be forgotten. He has a special place in my heart and always will. Thank you for your kindness, love, guidance, and comfort. I love you Tom. From Langdon. Tom always joked with me about how I was wearing the wrong shade of orange. He would say, your orange is just a little too bright for me. It needs a little more burnt orange in it. But it's more acceptable than those shades of red that are out there. I haven't been a part of Tom's family for very long, but an outsider looking in would have never guessed it. He and the rest of the family accepted us and made us feel like we had been, them, been with them all along. I can't say there have been many men in my life that have been a positive role model for God and being a God-fearing man, an outstanding father, and the most loving husband a woman could ever find, but I can say Tom was that person and so much more. I got to sit with Tom for a little bit while he was recently in the hospital, and words cannot express the feeling I experienced just holding his hand. Tom is truly a man of God, and you could feel it every minute you were with him. I thank God for blessing each and every one of us with Tom, and I know he is up there looking down on us, smiling with a big grin. He will have a comment for my two bright orange shirt when I get there one day. I love and miss you, Tom.
The next words I'll share are from Matt, Tom and Joanne's son. There's so much to say about my dad, but no words will tell the story of how awesome he was. He was so many things to all of us. He was a friend, co-worker, boss, employee, leader, husband, and grandpa, but to me he was my dad. He could always make me laugh with corny jokes that some people don't appreciate, and he was always there to give me his advice, even though I didn't always listen. He was so proud of all of us, and he made me feel like I was doing good every time I talked to him. He loved my stepmom with all his heart, and I am so glad that our family is what it is because they loved each other. He taught me almost everything I know that is worth knowing about being who I am today. He taught me about hard work and being honest. He taught me to treat others with respect and how I would want to be treated. I can't thank you enough, Dad, for everything I am. I'm going to miss your big hugs and our long talks about whatever we decided to talk about that day. I am so glad you are my dad. I love you. From Tom and Joanne's daughter, Amy. I am so blessed beyond words that God gave me my daddy, Tom. God truly smiled on our family. My favorite time is when we all got together over at Mimi and Papa's. He greeted us all with big smiles and bigger hugs. I will miss his big arms around me and knowing that I was his girl. We loved to argue who loved who the most. Tom usually won that battle, but that was okay with me. A few things that I want to thank my sweet Tom for are loving my precious mama and spoiling her, for sharing your children, what a showing your children what a true love story is all about with Christ as the center of your love, sharing your faith, and that following Christ is not by sight, and sharing your wisdom and integrity that you have instilled in each of us. Proverbs 20, verse 7. The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. I love you the mostest, your girl. From Amy's husband, Doug. I love Tom very much. He was like another father. He inspired me greatly with his selflessness. He gave his time and love and energy to all of us without asking anything in return. I will always love and miss him, and I will strive to be the father to my children that he was to all of us. From Doug and Amy's son, Ridge, Tom's grandson. I love you. I miss you, Papa. You are the best man ever. From Tom and Joanne's son, Ty. Tom was much more to me than just a parent. He was also a friend to talk to, to laugh with, and to work with. As smart as Tom was, he would still ask someone like me for advice about things he knew all about, not just to make me feel involved, but to gain my insight. Tom was a continuous learner who in turn encouraged my best. Thank you, Tom. I love you. And these words are mine. My parents were Robert and Kitty. They were wonderful parents whose unfailing kindness, support, and encouragement I will forever treasure. They love me unconditionally, and I will carry that love with me all my life. Kitty and Robert passed away 18 and five years ago, but during those times, I met and married Ty. Since then, my parents' names have also been Tom and Joanne. I have been blessed these last 15 years to have their kindness, support, and encouragement. They have also taught me what it means to be a Christian and to love the Lord. Tom was a man of many virtues. One I particularly admired was his tremendous intellect. He was the smartest man I've known, but still so humble in his quest for knowledge. He studied the Bible diligently, and his lessons were prepared as thoroughly as possible. I enjoyed learning from Tom, and he was a wonderful teacher. He shared what he had studied and learned, but he also inspired and led those around him to seek out their own answers and to pursue a closer relationship with God and his word. One verse in particular serves to comfort me and encourage me as I continue my own studies. 
Joanne shared this in one of her classes, and it will always remind me of the way Tom searched for a greater knowledge of the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Thank you, Tom, for loving us. But most of all, thank you for always leading us toward God. My final words are from Tom and Joanne's other sister, Kathy. Answered prayers. God is so good. We see our needs every day and bring them to our God. Sometimes we wrap them all up and give vivid detail, like our God doesn't already know exactly what we need. Years ago, our family prayed for my baby sister. We prayed that God would take care of her physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Our sweet baby sister had struggled so hard, but she grew strong in the Lord by grabbing hold of the hem of his garment and drawing herself closer each day. Her children were grown before God answered our prayers. Tom came quietly into our lives and blessed us all beyond description. He loved my baby sister like she deserved and had longed to be loved. He provided a stable home and kept her safe. God had surely answered our prayers. Joanne was happy and safe for the first time in years. As the years passed, Tom became more than a good husband. He became the solid foundation on which their family grew. Matt, Sam, and Eric were precious additions to Shane, Amy, and Ty. The love that flows in this family truly filters down from the top. The top or head of this family is God. Tom studied and became one with God. He took his role as spiritual leader of the home seriously. He used his godly wisdom to lead his family. He lived a Christian example that cannot just be taught. When we limit God with a detailed description of our needs, God says, I can do better than that. And in bringing Tom into our family, God just keeps on giving. Into this family, Tom brought love, stability, safety, acceptance, wisdom, and a direct link with God. Tom's greatest gift to this family was teaching us all about the love of God. Through his love for his family, he gave us a glimpse of God's love. Isn't that a husband's and father's most important role? We will miss you, Tom, and thank God for your precious life. As God comforts us through this loss, may we all follow Tom's example and continuously draw closer to the Lord. And may we exchange Tom's loving arms for the arms of the Father. Again, if you'll take your songbook and turn to number 490, 490, it is well with my soul. When peace like a
Well, the words that have been shared today have been so encouraging, have been so uplifting. And as I've listened to the stories, one thing that I cannot help but think is none of these things are by accident. They're all by the providential hand of God. And they're all by the hand of God in the fact that he led Tom, he guided Tom to be the person that he was. And so, as we've heard today, he was all about giving, not receiving. He reminds me of Barnabas, the player Barnabas in Scripture. And every time you see Barnabas, he's always building you up. He was always telling somebody else about the Lord. He was always encouraging others, especially in Acts 14, to turn from those worthless things to the living God. Tom was a Barnabas. He was a son of encouragement. My life was forever changed in the year 2002 when Tom and Joanne and, and these boys showed up in my Bible class upstairs one Sunday morning. And as I met them and found out that they had bought land and was planning to move this direction in the next few years, I always looked forward to Tom and Joanne and their family coming to class. And it didn't take long to realize, man, here is a spiritual giant. Always had a word to say, or two or three. Always had scripture to back it up. Always had stories to go along with that, and all of it was so meaningful. I miss Tom weekly saying, how are you, little brother? And I miss those nudges that he and I had about the Oklahoma Sooners and the University of Texas. We had some great and fun talks about that. I miss looking over here to my left as I was preaching, and I'm going to miss watching Tom. I'm going to miss seeing his Bible open. I'm going to miss his nods. That encouraged me. He was with me. He was a great encourager to me. I'm going to miss our talks in my study about life, about God, about the Bible, about family. And all of you kids, and Stacy, you've done a great job today just summarizing everybody's thoughts. You did a great job. And all of you kids, y'all were perfect. You may not think you are, but in his eyes, you were perfect. Your grandkids never made a mistake. Not to him you didn't. Maybe to your parents, but not to him. He loved you. That's just the life that Tom lived. And from the moment that he was baptized into Christ on November the 2nd, 1997, his life was forever changed. And to you and I, we would think, well, he had a lot of catching up to do. Well, let me tell you, he did it. He was a great teacher. He was a great preacher. I'll never forget the Sunday night in September, just a few months ago, all of his family drove into town on that Sunday night, and Tom just walked in just ready to go, probably not feeling like doing what he was about to do, but you would have never known that because he was fine. He was all right. And he preached the word that night took his Bible and his study guide to Tulsa because in his mind he had to check out of that hospital and get home for life group so he could teach on the Gospel of Luke. Even went through some of those passages with Joanne. Listen to this. Listen to what Luke says here. And you knew any time Tom said listen to this, it was going to be good. And I love how the family remembers this phrase. 
It didn't matter if you went to Tom and asked him about anything, about life, about advice on anything, from cars to cows to homes to the Bible, whatever it was, he would always say, well, let's think about that. Because he always, and I know it drove you crazy when he said that, because you really wanted to know what he thought. But what he wanted you to do more than anything was come to that conclusion on your own. He would give advice and he would guide, but he would never tell you what you needed to do. And I love that about that man. And from the mouths of babes, I love... Ridge would always say, what would Papa say about that? Ridge, for the rest of your life, buddy, go ahead and say those words. I wonder what my Papa would think and say about that. Don, I appreciate your words about y'all's time together in Lubbock just a few weeks ago. Joanne gave me a little bit of that story the other night. And I love the lesson that he taught because Tom was always humbled to understand how God could forgive him. You know, it's one thing to say God forgives you. But for Tom, when he owned that and it became personal to him, he just could not fathom how God could forgive him. And so the main jest of the lesson that day was simply this. Whose child are you? And what a great question for all of us. Whose child are you? And as you leave this place today, will you make a difference for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Because that's what it's about. Tom taught us that. But where did Tom learn it from? Almighty God. That life is all about God. Some words that really has brought some comfort to Joanne over the last few months. A poem entitled, God Saw You Getting Tired says, God saw you getting tired when a cure was not to be. So he wrapped his arms around you and he whispered, come to me. You didn't deserve what you went through, so he gave you rest. Oh, God's garden must be beautiful because he only takes the best. And when I saw you sleeping so peaceful and free from pain, I could not wish you back to suffer that. God saw that Tom was getting tired. And God said, I can take care of that. And all of us will long for that day to come in our lives. And all of us need to rest assured God can take care of it. And he will. He took care of it with his son Jesus. And he promised us that he's going to come back for his own. I want to be there that day, don't you? And all we can do right now, as we've said today, we can only imagine. And I'm so jealous of what Tom is going through. Tom has beat us to the punch to find out some of those answers from Scripture that we long to wait for. As Tom was growing up, His mother and his grandmother, as they would take the plate of food that Tom had eaten, as they would take the plate, they would always remind Tom, keep your fork because the best is yet to come. And all of Tom's life he lived. And you saw in the video today, he loved to eat. And he had a fun time eating. And he loved to eat desserts. And about a year ago, I found out that every morning, I love this, every morning he would drive into town to eat his donuts and drink his coffee, and he would take Jack. 
Now, as he got sick, he slowed the donuts down, but he ate a few every now and then. But I want you to think about that. Keep your fork, because the best is yet to come. And I want you to listen to Tom right now as he reads to us from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 through 19, and from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy placed by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith and having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful." And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I love Tom's booming voice as he would read scripture. And again, in the words of A.W. Tozer, written in the front of Tom's Bible, what I think about God is the most important thing about me. And he had another little phrase that he had written in his Bible. I'm not sure what was going through his mind as he heard this, but I love these words. Water is wet, but God is love. And he knew that. And he lived it out so well. And I want you to listen to these words from 1 Peter chapter 3. That Peter writes, beginning in verse 8, and I believe, as the family said, these words really summarize the life that Tom Wood lived. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but he was made alive by the Spirit. May God bless all of us 
And may God bless the life that Tom Wood lived. And for all of those in his family and friends who will hold close in their heart the precious memories that we've talked about today and ones that you will continue to talk about for the rest of your life. Again, take your songbooks and turn to number 448, 448, The Greatest Commands. You know, when you go last, there's always a fear that everything you're going to say has already been said. But Coach, in his great wisdom, said, it's okay to repeat things because we're talking about the same person. And it's pretty obvious from all the comments that have been made today, we're talking about Tom Wood. We all knew him the same way. Tom was my friend. But more than that, he was a brother in Christ. And it was a spiritual relationship that formed our friendship. Tom had a kind, gentle spirit. He was truly a blessing to me and I loved him for that. Tom and Joanne often confided in me as their elder shepherd. What a humbling thing it is to have watch over others 
as one who must give an account to God. But it was a privilege to serve them in this manner. In 2009, I was in need of a church life group co-leader. And as Patrick and I discussed possible men, Tom's name came to mind. And Patrick asked Tom if he would serve, and of course, he always accepted an opportunity to serve. He was always willing and able to lead and to teach. And so it was through our co-leading, a life group, that our friendship was bonded. We would take turns teaching. It was my turn Sunday evening, November 17th, but I had surgery scheduled the Friday before and not expected to go home until the following Saturday, so Tom was more than willing to take my turn. Some of the group noticed that Tom was not feeling well. The next life group meeting was this past Sunday, December 1st. And as Joanne told Patrick, she also told me that Tom had taken the lesson plan to the hospital in Tulsa, and two days before he died, he was studying and highlighting the lesson plan so he would be prepared to teach this past Sunday. He was in God's Word right up to the end. Tom was an exceptional teacher of God's Word. He put forth extra effort in perfecting his instruction and presenting God's truths. You always learn something new in his lessons. He exhibited special insight. He examined the Greek and Hebrew meanings to help his students better understand what God was communicating to his people. Tom's true colors shone through during his illness and medical treatment. When asked, how are you doing? Or how do you feel? He would smile and he'd say, I'm doing okay. I'm doing okay. Gene said he said, I'm doing fine. When Joanne asked me to speak today, I began to think of words that describe Tom. Words like faith, assurance, Trust and confidence quickly came to mind. When Tom said, I'm doing okay, he was saying, I have faith, assurance, trust, and confidence in the Lord who loves me and has secured my salvation. So I'm doing okay. Tom believed with all of his heart the inspired words of the Apostle John recorded in 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, and a concluding verse 13. The subject of this chapter is faith in the Son of God. The Apostle writes, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world, this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And then the apostle 
concludes in verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know, you may know that you have eternal life. So Tom's faith and belief in the Lord has allowed him to overcome the world so he can come over and live eternally with God. We have heard Tom's words, verses from the book of Hebrews. And we'll now conclude this memorial celebration by hearing a, a recorded excerpt of a lesson from Hebrews that Tom taught, and then a prayer that he offered that is so fitting for this occasion, and then we'll sing Beulah Land. And afterwards, you're invited to visit with a family out in the foyer. It's been an honor for Joanne to be asked to speak today as we honor Tom, and I thank you for that. So I guess in summary, we certainly face a lot of trials and tribulations ourselves, and we need encouragement. And, you know, maybe you want to make a little note up there by the title of Hebrews in your Bible that says, Keep Your Fork. Because when, when we get to those points in our lives where we need encouragement, you know, we can think about what's, what's coming and the promises that have been made to us in God's Word. An unshakable God, a faithful God, one who loves us so much that He sent our, His Son to die for us on a cross once for all. So I appreciate your attention. Uh, if we could, I'd like to end our time with a prayer. Our loving and merciful Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the many blessings that, that we have in this world. and Father, we thank you for the promises that you give us through your word of what's to come. May we always concentrate on Jesus every day and His beauty and His faithfulness to you. And may He always be our example. And Father, as we consider your glory and those promises, may we be excited and may that joy of your victory overflow to others that they might ask, what is it? that you have, and may we be always willing to share Jesus with others. Father, when we fall short of what you would have us be, please forgive us and guide us always. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm kind of home, kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before. No sad goodbyes will there be spoken. And time won't matter anymore. Beautiful land, I'm longing for you. And so.
I'm looking now, looking now across, across the, the river, river where my faith will end in sight. There's just a few, just a few more days. To labor, then I will take my heavenly flight. Beautiful, and I'm longing for you. Someday on thee I'll stand, there my home shall be I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The sun Closes. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet The birds hush their singing And the melody that he gave to me talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry the night around me be falling but he bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he with me and he talks we
with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other And he tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. 